Hello and welcome to Guidance Review. I'm David Pudwill, and today we're going to be talking about FDA's guidance document on implanted brain-computer interface devices for patients with paralysis or amputation, non-clinical testing, and clinical considerations. This guidance document was published in May 2021, and there are three key topics we'll discuss in today's video. They are, one, background on brain-computer interface devices and FDA involvement in the space, two, FDA recommendations for pre-submissions and investigational device exemption, or IDE, studies, and three, FDA's perspective on clinical study considerations for BCI uh, device studies. That's brain-computer interface studies. Without much further ado, we'll go ahead and get into uh, the video. We can pull up the guidance document here. Uh, we can also read the Federal Register notice. We can go to the docket, uh, go submit comments online if you'd like. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and pull up the guidance document. So we'll get into the guidance document here. Uh, and this is it. This uh, was the document that was issued on May 20th. 2021. The draft of this document was issued on February 22nd, 2019. And for more information, uh, you can contact the Office of Neurological and Phys uh, Physical Medicine Devices, uh, the Division of Neuromodulation and Physical uh, Medicine Devices uh, and Acute Injury Devices team. And here's a, a phone number that you can uh, contact. You can also go ahead and uh, reach out to uh, make public comment or get additional copies. If we get into uh, the table of contents here, we see it's it's quite extensive in terms of uh, you know the specific details that FDA has laid out uh, for pre-submission and, and IDE uh, content they'd like to see, and uh, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But first, uh, a high-level introduction of uh, FDA's engagement in this space. Uh, and, and FDA says here that this guidance document provides recommendations for, again, Q submissions or pre-submissions and investigational device exemptions or IDEs for implanted brain-computer interface, that's BCI, uh, devices for patients with paralysis or amputation. The field of implanted BCI devices is progressing rapidly from fundamental neuroscience discoveries to translational applications and market access. Implanted BCI devices have the potential to bring benefit to people with severe disabilities by increasing their ability to interact with their environment and consequently providing new independence in daily life. For the purpose of this guidance document, implanted BCI devices are neuroprostheses that interface with the central or peripheral nervous system to restore lost motor and or sensory capabilities in patients with paralysis or amputation. And uh, here FDA uh, also says that they believe it's important to help stakeholders, uh, that would be manufacturers, healthcare professionals, patients, patient advocates, academia, and other government agencies navigate the regulatory landscape for medical devices. Towards this goal, on November 21st, 2014, CDRH held an open public workshop on its White Oak campus with the aim of fostering an open discussion on the scientific and clinical considerations associated with the development of BCI devices. FDA considered the input provided during this workshop to develop the recommendations provided in this guidance document for implanted BCI devices. This guidance document provides non-clinical testing and clinical study design recommendations associated with implanted BCI devices. Non-clinical device testing can be used to demonstrate that potential risks have been mitigated prior to initiating a clinical study. Proper des design of clinical trials is essential to provide a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness necessary to support a regulatory submission and translation of BCI devices from concept to assisting device users. This guidance is a leapfrog guidance, which is a type of guidance that serves as a mechanism by which the agency can share initial thoughts regarding emerging technologies that are likely to be of public health importance early in the product development. Uh, this leapfrog guidance represents the agency's initial thinking and our recommendations may change as more information becomes available. And here there are some uh, additional links as well to the Q submission program or an FDA's recognized consensus standards database. 
and detail about the appropriate use of voluntary consensus standards. So then we get into the uh, into the scope, and specifically, FDA is focusing on on Q submission interactions and IDE feasibility and pivotal clinical studies. Non-clinical testing methods may not be available or may not sufficiently provide the information needed uh, to advance to a final version of an implanted BCI device under development. Therefore, if your device is still under development, FDA recommends that you consider performing an early feasibility study through an IDE. And here there's a link to a, a relevant guidance document on uh, early feasibility studies and first in human studies. Non-implanted BCI devices are outside the scope of this guidance as the regulatory considerations for non-implanted BCI devices may differ from those recommended in this guidance document, depending on various aspects such as but not limited to the technical characteristics and indications for use or patient population, and if your BCI device incorporates technological characteristics components or indications for use or patient population that are not described or referenced in this document, we recommend you submit a pre-submission to seek FDA feedback. Always, uh, always a good recommendation. If you can get um, an audience with FDA uh, as part of a pre-submission, uh, you should do it. So uh, go take a look at that Q submission guidance that FDA has linked here. And then uh, here in terms of the, the pre-submission IDE recommendations, some high-level sort of basic things that FDA is looking for is a dis device description, and they outline a couple things here that they would be interested in seeing. Uh, regarding that device description, that could be signal acquisition, signal processing, stimulation, delivery, assistive effector uh, component, sensor component for neural feedback, programming module, a general overview of the BCI device, a complete description of key components, which would include leads and connected cables, electrodes, uh, and various details uh, identified here in terms of the number of leads and connectors, their lengths, diameters, the geometry, the spacing, impedance uh, shows up here, implant location, sensor and or stimulation location. Uh, they're also looking for information on connectors, processing or st uh, stimulation hardware, what the power source is, signal filters, uh, number of output and recording channels, description of output specifications, assistor effector, uh, and or sensor components, uh, some more details here they're looking for in terms of the programmers and, and control units, um, some more details here as well. Uh, for algorithms, uh, there's uh, not a whole lot of content written here. The FDA is looking for uh, a description. They recommend the use of flow charts. Really, they're looking to, to see a map of what your algorithm does there. They might get into the detail to some extent of what that algorithm is, uh, but mostly, um, uh, if you can paint a visual picture for FDA, uh, that's going to be most helpful. And then in terms of wireless uh, function, uh, FDA wants to see some detail around that. And RF wireless technologies and some of the requirements around this are, have been a key area of, of FDA focus. Uh, so definitely recommend uh, you talk a little bit more um, uh, with FDA about this and get uh, some detail around it, specifically what they're going to want to see uh, for you to commence with your uh, with your studies, but also get some detail in in terms of RF and uh, and interference and, and and what all FDA's thinking is as you move towards um, a, you know, an eventual uh, device approval as well. And then here, uh, FDA also wants uh, some detail on uh, the battery. They want a thorough description of the overall device, how um, how how this interacts uh, with the patient, with uh, various other components. For a device that must be assembled, they want an exploded view or uh, uh, some other way of uh, presenting how these uh, components relate to each other. They want that clearly labeled, and uh, they want details on on the software. There, there's uh, actually uh, we were just talking about RF radio frequency wireless uh, expectations. FDA has linked their guidance document uh, for that here. They also want to, to know the the safety features you've built into your device the output uh, stimulation characteristics, and they've uh, also provided some more detail in Appendix A uh, about what they'd, what they'd expect to see for that. All devices intended to be used in conjunction with the implanted BCI uh, device. Uh, that would, uh, could be impl implantation tools, clips, or belts for body-worn components, and whether the devices are packaged or sold with the implanted BCI device. 
and they want a, a little bit of the detail here as well. Don't don't miss this next page. Uh, their expectations up above carry down into this one. And then uh, around risk management, FDA uh, recommends that, that you uh, apply accepted risk management principles. Uh, for instance, ISO 14971, while conducting risk analysis as part of your design controls requirement, that's 21 CFR 820. They also outline uh, certain verification validation testing expectations below. FDA recommends that the risk analysis detail a qualitative uh, examination of the potential hazards. Uh, they also recommend identification of hazards caused by single fault conditions. They would like to see that uh, risk analysis in a tabular format, and it should analyze all potential causes for the identified risks. All mitigating strategies or corrective actions should also be uh, identified with a detailed analysis on how the corrective actions reduce the clinical risk to acceptable levels. You should provide a rationale for why the levels are acceptable. And then in terms of software, uh, FDA wants uh, uh, you, you to detail the uh, significance. Uh, software in implanted BCI devices ensures that various components, uh, such as the signal processing modules and, and other hardware, operate as intended. Adequate software performance testing provides assurance that the device is operating within safe parameters. So this is FDA's uh, view that you know software uh, within your product is a significant thing that they that, that, that they want more detail about. And in terms of a recommendation, here FDA has linked their guidance for the content of pre-market submissions for software contained in medical devices for a discussion of the software documentation that you should provide in your uh, submission. And you should also uh, outline the level of concern. Um, and FDA believes that BCI devices are a major level of concern. If you believe that uh, this software is minor or moderate, you should provide a scientific justification that supports your rationale for the level of concern based on the possible consequences of software failure. And I would generally just advise um, select major. There might be instances where you could justify a different software level of concern, but it's unlikely for a BCI a device that follows the type of product that FDA has described above uh, for what's in scope for this guidance document. FDA recommends that you provide a full description. Again, follow the guidance that FDA gave you for early feasibility studies. Uh, FDA recommends that you provide adequate software performance testing to provide assurance that the system operates within safe parameters. As appropriate, you should provide information on the cybersecurity aspects of the device. Again, there's another guidance document here, content of pre-market submissions for management of cybersecurity in medical devices, and there are also some draft guidances out in this area. If the device includes off-the-shelf software, you should provide the additional information as recommended in the FDA uh, documents titled off-the-shelf uh, software use in medical devices and cybersecurity for network medical devices containing off-the-shelf or OTS software. Overall, the documentation related to the software contained in the medical device should provide sufficient evidence to describe the role of the software included in the device and performance testing to demonstrate that the software functions as designed. In terms of human factors, uh, FDA believes that it's important to understand and identify the potential hazards and ensure that you've designed a safe and usable uh, device. To understand and identify the use-related hazards, it's important to have an accurate and complete understanding of the specific behaviors required of users when using the device. And additional recommendations on risk management can be found in Section 3B of this guidance document. And uh, FDA notes that uh, many implanted BCI devices are likely to undergo early feasibility studies. Human factors validation and evaluation is typically not needed to support feasibility study approvals. However, human factors data may be needed to support your future marketing submission to the agency. If your device is still under development and you intend to pursue an early feasibility study through an IDE, the early feasibility study could be conducted to obtain uh, initial insights into human factors prior to implementing your early feasibility studies for implanted BCI devices. FDA recommends following Section 6 of the guidance document applying human factors and usability engineering to medical devices. FDA also recommends identifying a plan in your in investigational protocol to capture usability information during the course of the early feasibility study, if applicable. 
and, and FDA specifically calls out why they think that's important because uh, this will help you address and, and mitigate use-related hazards in final device designs. In terms of biocompatibility, uh, uh, FDA uh, uh, believes that uh, when, when used for their intended purpose, uh, these uh, BCI devices uh, may induce a harmful biological response. And uh, therefore, uh, FDA wants to see adequate uh, uh, testing of, of the uh, uh, components of your device, it wants to see that the product uh, that, that, that you're creating is biocompatible. And uh, here, for some device materials, it may be appropriate to provide a letter of authorization, an LOA for a device master file, or MAF. Um, and you sh should refer to Section M of this guidance document and the following FDA webpage for more information on that. Here's a link. If you're unable to identify a legally marketed predicate device with similar location, duration of contact, and intended use that uses the same materials as used in your device, FDA recommends you conduct and provide a biocompatibility risk assessment. You should identify any biocompatibility testing or other evaluations that were conducted to mitigate any remaining risks. FDA recommends that you follow FDA's guidance. Use of international standards, ISO 10993-1, which identifies the types of biocompatibility assessments that should be considered and recommendations regarding how to conduct the related tests. Uh, and here, the type of tests that are applicable to your device may depend on whether the electrodes interface with the central or peripheral nervous system. Additionally, uh, devices intended to be used in conjunction with the implanted BCI device may contact the patient in different ways and durations. Again, they refer you to ISO 10993-1. And here there are a couple different categories uh, for your implant. You should appropriately categorize the implant and then do the testing following that appropriate categorization. So FDA has given you a couple categories with the testing they would expect to see for your product for these different types of uh, contact type and duration. Here again is a list uh, included in this list. Uh, this list is uh, you know identified for um, testing to 30 days, uh, may include hemocompatibility, but in, in both cases includes cytotox, sensitization, irritation, inter intercutaneous reactivity, acute systemic toxicity, material-mediated pyrogenicity, subacute, subchronic toxicity, genotoxicity, implantation, neurotoxicity, uh, chronic toxicity, and carcinogenicity uh, testing. The, the, the key difference here is um, electrodes implanted in the cortex of the brain, they also want to see hemocompatibility, extract hemolysis testing. And uh, that's for a uh, contact duration of 30 days. For less than 24 hours, FDA wants to see cytotox sensitization, irritation or intracutaneous reactivity, acute systemic toxicity, and material-mediated pyrogenicity. And that's for external communicating uh, devices, so that would be uh, leads that enter the body. Uh, and then for surface devices, with limited or, or, or prolonged or, or permanent contact with intact skin, they want to see cytotox, sensitization, and irrit irritation or intracutaneous reactivity testing. They want to see cytotoxicity, sensitization, and irritation or intracutaneous reactivity testing for, um, for these components. In terms of sterility, uh, FDA believes that this is, uh, th that it's important. Uh, that uh, implanted BCI components and surgical tools are uh, uh, labeled as sterile, and uh, FDA recommends that you provide the information outlined uh, below. This sort of standard sterility uh, information that FDA is looking for, about methods and sterility assurance level, etc. In terms of pyrogenicity, uh, to address the risks associated with the presence of bacterial endotoxins, uh, the BCI devices should meet pyrogen limit specifications, and here there's a link on pyrogen and endotoxin testing, questions and answers, and use of an international standard ISO 10993-1, um, again linked here. And additionally, FDA recommends providing your routine batch release LAL monitoring procedures. And for devices intended to be labeled as non-pyrogenic, FDA recommends that both bacterial endotoxins and material-mediated pyrogens be addressed. Uh, in terms of shelf life and packaging, uh, FDA uh, outlines a couple of recommendations here as well uh, regarding maintaining uh, package integrity and sterility, and they refer to ANSI AMI ISO 11607-1 and 11607-2, and they provided a couple of links uh, here to uh, uh, some later sections. 
and FDA recommends providing your protocol for shelf life testing, and they recommend that you age your devices according to ASPM F1980. In terms of electrical safety and electromagnetic compatibility, FDA uh, wants you to follow uh, ANSI AMI uh, ES60601-1 and ANSI AMI IEC60601-1-2 and ISO14708-1 and ISO14708-3 uh, as applicable. Those are their recommendations. Uh, in terms of wireless technology, if you incorporate radio frequency wireless technology such as Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or RFID, uh, FDA uh, refers you to AMI TIR-69, also to the ANSI IE, IEEE uh, C63.27 uh, regarding wireless coexistence. And uh, here FDA has a link for design considerations for devices intended for home use, uh, as well as radio frequency wireless technology and medical devices, a couple links to some relevant guidance documents there. And in terms of MR compatibility, FDA identifies a couple potential issues around uh, magnetic resonance or MR compatibility, and they recommend that you address uh, the issues affecting safety and compatibility for your implanted BCI device as described in uh, FDA's testing and labeling of medical devices for safety in the magnetic resonance MR environment guidance document that they've also given you a link for here. Uh, in terms of non-clinical bench testing, FDA recommends that non-clinical bench testing outlined below be addressed in your IDE. Uh, in general, uh, this the typical duration of implants should be considered when determining appropriate test methods for characterizing durability uh, of the various components. And FDA recommends you specify clinically justified acceptance criteria for testing. And here FDA outlines uh, some things that they'd expect to see for electrodes, uh, dimensional verification and visual inspection, impedance, accelerated lifetime testing for leads and connections, uh, dimensional verification and visual inspection, leakage current, lead body and uh, connector flex fatigue testing, tensile strength of the lead, uh, connector insertion and withdrawal forces, particulate matter hazards, corrosion resistance, compliance with 21 CFR 898.12. Uh, in, in terms of implanted casings and electronics, uh, they want to see uh, hermeticity uh, testing, environmental testing, header adhesion testing, battery testing, and then for output simulation uh, measurements, they outline a couple considerations here and refer you to Appendix A. Uh, for output uh, stimulation safety, uh, FDA uh, has some um, notes for you here and some links to, to sections uh, 3N1 and 3N2. Uh, FDA recommends you provide a scientific rationale and or animal studies to support the safety of the stimulation output parameters. And that includes maximum current, charge density, current density, charge per phase, frequency, and duration. And analysis of the safety of the output stimulation parameters provides assurance that the risk of tissue damage is minimized during the use of the device. FDA also wants to see some details around the programmers and control units, as outlined here. Details about radio frequency transmitter and receivers, uh, as outlined uh, here. And again, uh, FDA refers to ISO 14708-3. And FDA wants to see mechanical, electrical, and transmission distance uh, testing. And then FDA also wants to see system-level testing. They think it's important for devices that have multiple uh, components that may be interchangeable to achieve uh, different and, and configurable clinical uses. They think that it's important that you have this, uh, this, this system-level uh, testing of the uh, interoperability of the components. So in here they talk about mix and match and some considerations for that. And in whatever configuration you would recommend the use of the device, uh, FDA wants you to uh, evaluate the entire system. And here they outline a couple of the key things that they want to see. And then in terms of referencing master files and other FDA pre-market submissions, here is a, a link and some detail. In terms of non-clinical animal testing, it's generally recommended to evaluate the in vivo safety of implanted BCI devices, particularly for new design significant device modifications and new indications. 
and uh, FDA says that animal testing of implanted BCI devices should address risk factors that cannot be evaluated through bench tests or in a clinical study. The study design and endpoint should be based upon the mechanism of action of the device and mitigation of risk. And here, uh, FDA refers you to the QSUB uh, program for discussing you know, any considerations around animal testing with FDA, and they've also given you a guidance on investigational device exemptions for early feasibility medical device clinical studies, including certain first in human studies as well, for more information on the device evaluation strategy and how leverage information may support your rationale. And then uh, FDA has some general considerations for animal studies here as well, and uh, they refer to GLP. Uh, and here for animal study protocols, a couple of the things that FDA would expect to see. They also call out choice of animal models, number of animals, controls, study duration, safety tests, reliability test, uh, acute stimulation test, long-term stimulation test, surgical approach. And then for clinical performance testing, FDA uh, wants to see a report of prior investigations uh, on similar or related devices. The subject device or similar device used for a different uh, use, a narrative description of uh, the purpose of the study, whether the study was pivotal, supporting, or feasibility, the design of the study, the number of patients enrolled, the number of investigational sites, both inside the U.S. and outside the U.S., the primary study endpoints, the amount of available follow-up, a summary of results and conclusions. And then FDA gets into their clinical study considerations and their recommendations for some aspects of a clinical study for implanted BCI devices. And here they refer again to that first in human uh, study guidance, design consideration for pivotal clinical investigations uh, for medical devices. Generally, FDA believes implanted BCI devices addressed by this guidance document are significant risk uh, or SR devices subject to all requirements of the IDE regulation. So bear that in mind. FDA has basically said, if you're a device along the lines of what they've outlined in this guidance document, they expect that you're a significant risk. And then this is just sort of standard uh, uh, you know, language. You can go check out significant risk and non-significant risk medical device studies uh, for some more detail about how risk is determined and who's responsible uh, for determining risk. Uh, but bear in mind as well for this, FDA has already told you uh, that uh, they believe implanted BCI devices addressed by this guidance document are significant risk devices. So FDA has already told you uh, what you need to know in, you know in terms of SR versus NSR. In terms of patient populations, FDA wants you to, to outline in your IDE a submission or a clinical study protocol when you're preparing that. FDA wants you to outline the patient population, uh, whether there's going to be home use, and FDA believes it's important to study BCI devices in realistic home use environments, how to manage startup and maintenance, uh, monitor patient progress, um, ensure that people can contact the physician when necessary. And they want to see the investigational plan, the purpose, objective, the study design, and some details here in terms of what they would expect to see there. The study duration and follow-up schedule, inclusion and exclusion criteria. And then some various uh, indications or exclusions from the clinical study that should be considered or outlined here on page 33. Patient demographics is something FDA is, uh, is interested in seeing. Treatment parameters and protocol, the endpoints and other outcomes, the primary effectiveness endpoint and secondary effectiveness endpoints, um, patient input. Potentially, this could be patient preference information. FDA has given you a link here to a, a patient preference uh, a guidance document. And uh, FDA is also uh, a linked uh, patient reported outcome measure uh, uh, guidance document here as well. Uh, FDA also highlights uh, that they want to see the informed consent document. They want to see statistical analysis plan considerations. And they give you some detail on, on that here. And that, uh, that wraps it up for the guidance here. We've got Appendix A. There's some stimulation output specifications and, and detail that you should take a look at as well. Uh, some uh, uh, diagrams and, and detail in here in terms of what FDA is going to want to see uh, regarding your stimulation output uh, specifications. Uh, but that's it for, um, that's it for today's uh, guidance document. So we'll go ahead and wrap up just reminding you that today 
uh, we have been talking about FDA's guidance document on implanted brain-computer interface devices for patients with paralysis or amputation, non-clinical testing, and clinical considerations. Three key topics we discussed today are one, background on brain-computer interface or BCI devices and FDA involvement in the space. Two, FDA recommendations for pre-submissions and investigational device exemption or IDE studies. And three, FDA's perspective on clinical study considerations for BCI uh, device studies. Well, I just want to thank you very much for spending your time with me today. I hope that you found today's video informative and useful. Uh, and uh, I hope that you uh, go out and, uh, and, and use this to make the world uh, a better place. I look forward to catching you in the next video. And until then, have yourself a wonderful day, a great week, and a great month ahead. I'll see you. Bye.